I'd like to ask everyone to close your eyes. Try to imagine that it's Monday morning. You've just woken up, but your alarm's gone off a couple of times, like maybe five or six. <laughs> You're already running late. So do you do your best to get out of bed, get moving, and go to work. When you're driving on the highway, you're already mad about the traffic, and then someone driving an obnoxiously loud car cuts you off. You may even honk the horn at them. And wait for it, they just flip the bird at you. That's right, middle fingers midair at this point. You continue on your drive, and when you get to work, you see a colleague. Now, I want you to really try and think about the state you'd be in when you see this person. Would you be happy to see them? Would you be able to be your best self with them? Could you offer some help if they ask for your opinion on something? Or would you already be tainted by that experience with that middle finger genius you just dealt with on the way over? Be honest. You're being graded on this. I'm just kidding. You can open your eyes. If you can relate to that story at all, then you're in the right place. If you can't see yourself in that scenario, then congratulations. Please share your tips with us afterwards. And if any of that gave you any level of anxiety, then that's also a great sign. I was lying just now when I said that anxiety was a great sign, but I just started this talk and I'm trying to be optimistic, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. The truth is, if you can relate to that on any level, then you most likely need to hear this. So thank yourself in advance, because this will involve stopping what you're doing, resisting that urge to use your phone, and allowing yourself some time to just sit still. That's right, stillness. What a concept. Stillness is something that we might think we get to do every day, but in reality, unless we're practicing it consciously, then we're not doing it. Stillness is something that people try to achieve when they're practicing yoga or meditation. Stillness is always the goal because it allows you to go inside and see what's going on internally. 90% of yoga is off the mat, accounts for that time that you spend in the outside world because you're taking those resources and using them internally so that you can share their benefits externally. Yoga was always been so much more than a fitness class. It's a mindset. But if these practices are new to you, I'm talking about yoga and meditation, then this might be a little bit scary at first because spending that time in stillness also means that you need to allow for negative thoughts and emotions to come up. And I'm talking about the really gross, vulnerable gook, right, that we don't want to acknowledge. Nobody wants to show the world their gook, right? <laughs> And these practices might seem simple enough, and yet they've been overlooked and avoided at a time when we need them the most. But we can't take care of each other unless we take care of ourselves first. It's just that simple. But I just want to put a disclaimer out here. I didn't come up with these practices. They've been along for a around for a long time. I ain't no Magellan, okay, and I don't pretend to be. But I am someone who's found the need to make these practices part of my life. And I teach them now, so I'm here talking to you about them because I think that maybe they could help you too, right? Today, everything moves at light speed, right? And we've come to expect that from one another. We want instantaneous travel, technology, and response from each other. But in reality, as human beings, we just weren't made that way. We weren't made to live in fight or flight mode all the time, and yet we find ourselves there time and time again. This is hardly what I would call being our best self, wouldn't you? Yeah. I first learned about meditation from my mom when I was 12 years old in the suburb that I grew up in. We were walking the dog one day, and this suburb is just located outside of Toronto, Canada. It's called Scarbra. I don't know if you've heard of it. That's short for Scarborough. We also said garage instead of garage where I grew up because we're a very fancy and prestigious family. Very fancy, very prestigious. <laughs> but I remember my mom telling me to feel the bench against my back and the wind on my face, and I didn't understand the depths of what she was teaching me at that time, but I was interested. 
Yoga and meditation would be something that she would bring me back to whenever I was feeling down, is experiencing pain, or looking for answers. But it would take a long time before I would dust off my ears, quiet down my very loud ego, and listen. And this process involved struggle for me, because at that time, that's what I thought life was about, struggle. Before I started making these practices part of my life and taking proper care of my mental health, I let myself become a prisoner in my own mind. I was more concerned about what people thought about me externally instead of going inside and seeing what was going on internally. I had it backwards, and as a result, I was very miserable, mad, sad, bitter. It's hardly my best self, I would say, right? Pretty sure I cut you off on the highway that day when I flipped you the bird. Sorry. But these negative emotions grew and grew until finally one day I was ready to come back to yoga, back to meditation, and back to myself. But I'm not going to lie to you, these, this was a really hard experience for me. Because spending that time in stillness meant that I had to be honest with myself, that I didn't like the person I was projecting outward. I had to go and do some work, some internal work. I had to show my gook, put my gook out on display. Practicing yoga and meditation helped me grieve painful experiences like the death of my father and a, a divorce that I went through. And these experiences also equipped me with what I call an emotional tool belt that prepared me for those difficult times, but also for the great ones. But trust me when I say, like I said before, that being left alone with your thoughts and emotions is very difficult. I'm not pretending that it's not. But the more you start to do these practices, the more it starts to pull out the compassion, shine a light on the light inside of you, and it brings your needle back to a central place, a place far away from anxiety and fear, and much closer to a place of tranquility and calm. The postures in yoga were created to assist with meditation and not the other way around. And the most important posture is called Shavasana, or corpse pose, where you lie down and let your body melt into the ground. The stillness is the key in that time because it allows for any emotion to come up, both emotionally, physically, any other emotion that you can think of. It allows for that time and it allows for no distractions, no phones, no nothing, just stillness. And this is why things like meditation retreats and float tanks are becoming more and more popular these days because deep down we want to be still. We want to do that internal work because we know that it glows from the inside out, not the outside in. <laughs> Yoga was never about standing on your head. You may never stand on your head and still have the most beautiful practice out there because it's perfect for you. 90% of yoga is off the mat means that those processes that you learn inside a studio create a guideline for you that you can bring into the outside world. It helps you to get centered, feel grounded, and it builds a foundation for you that will ignite the light inside of you that you doubted during times of pain. And it was during this experience that I learned how to tear down that pain and reveal that glowing light inside of me that I speak of. And this light that I mentioned glows in all of us, every single one of us, everyone watching this right now. We are all bright lights. I went on a yoga retreat Yes, I eat, pray, loved my way through my divorce. <laughs> well aware that I'm a walking cliche, and that's fine. But this experience was the turning point for me because it showed me a new way of living, a way of living that left me full up and wanting to show others how they can do the same. Also, through teaching yoga and through a wellness podcast that I host, I've had the opportunity to speak to various working professionals who use these processes as part of their lives and part of their careers. They explain that meditation and yoga help them come back into their bodies so that they're ready to take on the outside world. They explain that it helps with grounding and centering because no matter what the world throws their way, if they have that repetitive process, then they feel ready. I'm ready, life, come get me. <laughs> it also helps with issues like anxiety. Anxiety is a buzzword these days. We know this word far too well, but these practices can help you with that because they ask you to slow down, recognize the thoughts as they're coming in, and then let them go. 
It's like you become a traffic conductor for your thoughts. You can go ahead and picture yourself in one of those conductor outfits if that helps. Maybe one of those crossing guard outfits. I don't know. I don't know where your visual's at. It also helps with issues like depression. Because similar to medication, meditation boosts the same neurotransmitters in your brain. The only difference is it doesn't have any side effects and it's free. It can also help with those struggling with addiction. Individuals who I've spoken to who are on their journey to sobriety explain that this repeti repetitive process is something that helps them overcome urges without the use of substance. These processes also help with renegotiating trauma. We now know that trauma lives in the body. So by doing these practices, we learn how we can release these traumas, both emotionally and physically. I hope that if you take anything from what I've shared with you today, that you leave here thinking about what more you can do for yourself and your mental health. Don't be afraid to ask someone. Ask someone about a yoga class they take, or a meditation app on your phone, or a YouTube link, and then try one. Give it a real go. You might like it, you might hate it, but I just ask that you try and think of it like a workout for your brain. And if you already do these practices, then please share your experiences with people. Tell people about your morning routine. Tell people about what yoga teacher you can't live without or what app works for you, for you before you go to sleep. You're not just helping the, close, the people in your closest vicinity, you're contributing to a larger conversation about mental health, which like physical health, applies to everyone. And you're also creating space in your world so you can help those around you. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes again. This time, it's tomorrow. Your alarm's gone off once, maybe twice. Nobody's perfect. But today you decide you're going to wake up five minutes earlier and you're going to do a meditation. And these five minutes could inevitably ch change your day in a very different way. When you're finished your meditation, you get ready for work and you get into the car. When you're driving on the highway, someone driving an obnoxiously loud car cuts you off but you resist that urge to honk the horn at them. And instead, you smile. And you think, maybe they're late today. Maybe they didn't give themselves those five minutes that I did. And you thank yourself. When you get to work, you see a colleague, and before they can say anything to you, you ask them what you can do to help them today. Thank you. Thank you.